Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another edition of Relatable. I am your host, Stephanie Michelle. We've got a little bit of a light start today, and that's the beauty of live streaming. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but it is live, and you get real interaction and real relating, and we're not cutting out or uh, editing out any butts or anything like that because this is real life. So that's my take on things. Anyhow, we are going to be talking about community today and how we relate in our communities. And of course, that brings me to talking about my favorite thing, relationships. So we know that having good relationships is the number one factor to well-being. Why? Because there is the relational ripple effect. How we relate with others affects how we experience the world and how the world relates back to us. So in general, if you feel good about how you're relating, you generally feel good. You're experiencing less anxiety, less depression, less stress, and less sickness. You may think more about close relationships when I talk about relating and relationships in general, but what about the people in the places that you most frequent? What about those people? How do they affect your well-being? Uh, they matter. So the people in your community absolutely make a difference in your day and how you feel about it. Um, think about this, like think about the person that makes your coffee and how they always greet you with a smile or you know, stop to open a door or tell you about new features at their store. Um, these people make a tremendous, a tremendous difference in how you experience the world. And this difference is the number one reason why I moved to downtown Los Angeles about three years ago. I relocated both my business and my home here. And part of the, part of the reason for that is I like the idea of being able to walk around a community and people to get to know people and they get to know me. And now these people make such an impact in my life, you know, and I've been talking to you guys a lot about I want to show more of the people in this community and, and how they make a difference. And they don't even know they're making a difference, but they do. They just like make waking up and knowing that you're going to walk in this direction and see this person have a conversation just gives you something to look forward to. This is why I love downtown LA. I gave up my car because I love this so much. I, I don't know if you knew that. Yeah. <laughs> I walk so much. And you know, uh, experience everything on foot. Like even gathering your groceries is kind of liberating when you're on foot and doing that yourself. But you see so many people walking the dog. You see and interact with people over and over again. I even have skateboarders that see me now with a dog, and they get off their skateboard because they know it bothers my dog, and they stop and say hello and ask how he's doing. That's community, and that's what I have here in downtown Los Angeles. And when I think about these things that I love about this community, I have to give credit to some of that love in this direction because this person sitting next to me has been directly or maybe you know one step away uh, uh, in the experience or uh, connected to the experience that I'm having because of his purpose of making this community great and growing downtown Los Angeles. So I'm very grateful for that. So we should meet him, right? So this is Hal Bastian. Hello. <laughs> he is a 35-year commercial real estate veteran who has been a leader in downtown Los Angeles. We affectionately call it DTLA. So you'll hear us talk about that when we're talking about it. But he's been a leader in the DTLA renaissance since 1994. He is fondly called Mr. Downtown. We call him Mr. DTLA, too, <laughs> <laughs> by many. And he has helped recruit over 300 restaurants, bars, nightclubs, retailers, including the Ralph's, the grocery store that I shop at, um, Bottega Louie, Whole Foods, I shop there as well. It's closer, so I go there more often. <laughs> Sorry, Ralph's. <laughs> Hal has been at the forefront of the DTLA residential reassurance, right? I have, uh, the, I'm, Resurgence. Thank you, I'm tongue-tied this morning. I need to drink some water. Uh, starting with Starting with his leasing of the Old Bank District, DTLA's first adaptive reuse project. Today, he is a consultant and a transactional real estate broker and a friend to all in downtown Los Angeles. Well, Hi, Hal. Hi, Steph. <laughs> Welcome. Good to see you. Good to see you, too. Thanks for having me on. Uh, how could I move my show to downtown Los Angeles <laughs> and not have you on pretty soon in that lineup? I, I, mean, I did all this for you. Yeah. Oh, thanks. You know, I, <laughs> and I many like, others. Yeah, and many others. Well, so... Hal, every time that someone sits in this chair, I usually ask them, like before we start on our topic about community in downtown Los Angeles, mm -hmm. is there anything that you want to share to just get off your chest before we 
<laughs> go further into our conversation. Well, yeah, maybe an explanation of what community is. Okay. You know? uh, and to, to you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, to me. Okay. I mean, I look at the whole world from my perspective. Yeah. Right? Most of us do. <laughs> <laughs> so community is about interrelationships of people uh, and... Uh, you know, not anonymous stuff, yeah. although a wave on the street is, is always nice. I like to tell a story. I, I was born in downtown Los Angeles at Queen of Angels, so I didn't land too far from the tree. Here yeah. I am. But my mom uh, lived in Northridge. Uh -huh. And after the Northridge earthquake, you know, all the cinder block walls fell down. And prior to the earthquake, uh, everybody would wave each other across the hedge. That was it. When the walls came down, they were in each other's kitchens yeah. having coffee yeah. and talking because they shared a common experience. Yeah. And when the walls went back up, it stopped. And here in downtown LA, the walls stayed down. Mm -hmm. I love that story. I love that story. Yes, it, there is something about when you are walking and mm -hmm. you're out, like seeing the same people or you have the same routine, maybe you get your coffee at the same place or your newspaper, you are in an experience every minute of the day that you're in this community, and it is together with somebody. So there are no walls. I mean, I like that. I like that story a lot. Yeah. You can use it I, 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 may, I, may, I may have to <laughs> give you credit for yeah. it. All right, well, tell me. So you were born not too far from downtown Los Angeles. Like, what were you like as a child? Because like, tell us a little bit well, about how growing up. I, I am an only child. Okay. And... Uh, I loved being around adults more than I liked being around, you know, kids my own age. Yeah. And so I started talking uh, uh, when, you know, I was two and I haven't stopped. <laughs> 57 and a half years. <laughs> did, did anybody tell uh, you? Three days. <laughs> did, did anybody tell you what your first word was? No, no one ever told me that. I'd be interested yeah. to know. It was probably hi. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I expect it was. Hey, what, what, what are you about? Might have been a question. Yeah. Tell me something about but, you. Well, what is a day in the life of Hal's today? Like, what does your day oh, look like? Well, they're all different. Okay. Um, they do have certain um, elements that are the same. I mean, when I get up in the morning, there's a certain ritual yeah. that I do in the house. And, you know, I go in the bathroom, I put on my shaving cream, I come back, I make the bed, and then I go back and shave. You know, it makes sense, yeah. right? And uh, I feed Scooter, you know, along the way. And then, you know, his dog. Uh, yeah, Scooter, my dog Scooter. Dog. Uh, rescued off Hill and Pico in downtown Los Angeles. So he's a downtown dog. And I, I do things. And then uh, I go get sober in the morning. Mm -hmm. And I do that. In fact, I go to um, Subway uh -huh. uh, and uh, to get coffee. Yeah. $1.69 versus five bucks. I'll buy five bucks coffees once in a while, but you know, I drink Folger, so you know. <laughs> so I go in, and before I'm to the counter, the coffee is there waiting for me. And it's very interesting because there's the same cast of characters every morning at 7, mm -hmm. 10. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's its own sense of community. Absolutely. Yeah. That's pretty amazing. What you just described to me is kind of your smart start. Like mm -hmm. the reason why people, successful people, have mm -hmm. some sort of ritual in the morning, it's like their smart start. Mm -hmm. Like what do yeah. they need to kind of do something yeah. for themselves before they enter into that right. day of task and right? interruptive, yeah. you know, things. The making of the bed is very, very important. I make my bed too. I, I make my bed even when my housekeeper is coming later. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Do you clean the house yes, before she comes? I do. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know where I heard this once. But, uh, the, some lady would always clean the house before the maid came. And then she thought, you know, maybe she's just pouring the cleaning products down the toilet and acting as if she's clean, but she's not cleaning at all. <laughs> but anyway, after that morning stuff, um, I typically go to the gym. Yeah. And fitness is a huge, huge part of my life. And I almost died in 06 of a ruptured appendix, and I was out of commission for a long time, and then I had a, a surgery in 08 to fix up a lot of stuff. Yeah. And on August 28, 2008, uh, I got back to the LA Athletic Club, which I call my sanctuary. Mm -hmm. And uh, they say 21 days makes a habit. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, that's nonsense. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna work out some uh, every day in some way, shape, or form. Mm -hmm. uh, once a day, every day, until the day I don't. And um, I haven't gone today 
But as of yesterday, that that was. Uh, <laughs> Tell them the number. I'm like three thousand four hundred and seventy days in a row. Three thousand four hundred and seventy days in a row. This right. man has yeah. worked out. Right. Come rain or shine. That's right. Come cold weather or warm weather. Yeah. So it's nine years, five months, and twenty nine days to wow. be exact. And after this, I'm going to go and 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 do it again. The the result of that. And by the way, I can do that because I live seven blocks away from the LA Athletic Club. I don't spend two to three hours a day commuting. Yes. Right? I hear you. I'm going to so, high five you There you one. go. <laughs> I'm 57 years old and I feel 27. Yeah. And that's a wickedly good combination, especially for people like you and me who just tend to run yeah. fast. Because you have the brain, you have the yeah. knowledge, but you have yeah. the physical aspects that can keep up with all of that. Yeah. yeah. So oh, often yeah. I'll be on the, the life cycle reading the paper. So mm -hmm. I'm multitasking, right? Mm -hmm. I'm sitting on that thing for 40 minutes mm -hmm. and sweating and reading the paper. Uh, and so I get that done and then I start my day. And sometimes it starts with meetings. Uh, sometimes it's, it's going through, you know, emails and doing all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you work for yourself, it's about business development and working on projects or deals at the same time. Working in the business and on the business. <laughs> yeah, because mm -hmm. there's nobody there to do business development for you. Absolutely. You know, you're totally sovereign and uh, I love it. Yeah. You know, I, re I really uh, like it and I, I don't have to um, explain to people what needs to be done. I just do it. At some point, you know, I'll probably need somebody to, to help, but um, right now I just like just getting it done and mm -hmm. doing transactional real estate, doing consulting, and I do tours of downtown too. What does that mean, transactional real estate? It means doing deals. So representing, mm -hmm. I, I have an affinity for retail okay. and, and restaurants and um, things that are on the ground floor that, that change the public realm right. from a pedestrian uh, experience. And I like affecting that. Mm -hmm. uh, when you do an office space deal, which I do too, it's you know up on the 10th floor, nobody mm -hmm. sees it and it just doesn't have uh, as much of an impact. So transactional real estate is when you're working and transacting and negotiating deals. Sometimes you represent an owner, a landlord mm -hmm. of a building, and you're seeking tenants to put in a space. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes you're representing a tenant who's seeking to get into a market and you go to uh, a building, it's represented by a broker, and you, mm -hmm. you split the commission just like when you're selling a house. So it's more uh, than real estate for you. So how yeah. has, the, the first thing that I knew about you before I met you is like, this man it considers it his purpose <laughs> mm -hmm. to really see the downtown Los Angeles area come into life, you know, to be right. revitalized, to be a safe community mm -hmm. for people. Why this? Why this purpose for you? Well, it, it organically developed. Mm -hmm. I, I moved downtown in 94 to go to work for Cushman Wakefield, a big, big brokerage firm, to lease the retail component of what was then Broadway Plaza, which became Macy's Plaza mm -hmm. at uh, 7th and Flower, yeah. which is now called The Block. And that's how I got introduced to downtown. I didn't intend to come downtown, but I did. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I heard of this guy named Tom Gilmore in the, the late, uh, late 90s. Mm -hmm. And Tom was using something called the Adaptive Reuse Ordinance. Uh, which allowed for conversion of old office buildings into residential. Mm -hmm. Until 1965, the tallest commercial office buildings in downtown were 13 stories. And when late 60s, when we started building the modern downtown. Mm -hmm. I live which, in one of those yeah. 13 story buildings. Yeah, yeah. right, yeah. so it, well, the tall buildings that we see now. Mm -hmm. When that happened, people moved off of Hill and Broadway mm -hmm. and Spring and Main and they moved to the new downtown and these buildings were empty for 40 years. So a woman named Carol Schatz, who's a leader in the community, um, head of the Central City Association uh, at the time and the Downtown Center Business Improvement District, started looking around the country to see what were other, what, what were other cities doing with their functionally obsolete office buildings. Mm -hmm. And other uh, cities were converting them into housing. But we didn't have a law that allowed for it. It was a commercially zoned building, the mm -hmm. game was over. So Carol got everybody in the room. And uh, in 1999, June of 99, the Adaptive Reuse Ordinance was passed. And the um, first person to take big advantage of that was Tom Gilmore. And I was always curious as to what you know he was up to. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, on my last day at Cushman Wakefield, because I it was leaving, leaving that position, it was leap year day, February 29th, 2000, I met with Tom. Mm -hmm. And just to talk about his project, the, which he dubbed the Old Bank District, three historic buildings mm -hmm. on Forest Street between Spring and Main. And during the course of this conversation, he asked me what I was up to, and I said, well, I'm trying to figure out my next opportunity. Mm -hmm. He says, well, right there, 
this is about an hour into it, he said, well, why don't you become our leasing director and lease up this community? And we negotiated a deal and I went to work the next day on March 1st. Wow. Yeah. And, and that is really uh, the, the first uh, five years or so with Cushman and Wakefield got me you know, involved in downtown, but I seldom went east of like, all of. <laughs> I didn't even know this area existed. Yeah. And then when I started working for Tom, I got exposure to this. And then Carol called me uh, a couple years into it and uh, said, hey, you've done a great job of building this community and we'd like you to do it over and over again. So that's, that's how it happened. But the key element uh, of going to work for Tom Gilmore and his partner, mm -hmm. uh, Jerry, a lady, Jerry Peroni, um, was that we introduced being dog friendly to downtown. In, in any city, it's, it's hard to have a dog yeah. or, or a cat and have landlords accept you because there's wear and tear and there's pee and poop and there's all yeah. those things. But we had uh, knocked down all the walls on the, these office floors and, and uh, we'd taken up the, the, um, the, the carpeting and the linoleum and, the, and the, the glue and it was just down to concrete. And these were loft style apartments, meaning mm -hmm. there was one room in the bathroom. Mm -hmm. And we had sealed it with epoxy. And uh, I said, why don't we be dog friendly? Oh. And that was a, like a la moment. Yeah, yeah. And at the end of the day, I leased uh, 230 apartments to 350 people with 150 dogs. Yes. <laughs> and that's when it started. Yeah. And my dog buddy, the golden retriever, uh, was a big part of that. Mm -hmm. And it changed the world because talking about community, now people were on the street. Mm -hmm. uh, before, the, we had people shooting up in front of our buildings, yeah. and which is its own tragedy in another show. Mm -hmm. uh, but when people started coming by, it wasn't comfortable. So unfortunately, they were still shooting up, but they were a street over. Yeah. People were talking to each other. Oftentimes, we knew each other by our dog's name, but not our name. That happens a lot. Yeah. <laughs> You're Deetsy's mom, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so uh, 18 years later, uh, dogs are everywhere mm -hmm. in downtown, and that helps to create the community that we're, we're talking about. Absolutely. And people who have dogs in their life are loving people. I yeah. mean, they're experiencing unconditional love at a, you know, every day on the hour. So, yeah. Yeah. That's why I'm single. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> nobody can be. Nobody can nobody be can with a dog. Yeah. Nobody can. I might. I might resemble a little of that remark as well. <laughs> Oops. Um, well, so speaking of dogs, one of my favorite favorite events in downtown Los Angeles mm -hmm. is an event for dogs that you happen to start. Start. Yeah. Talk about that event. Well, it's, uh, it's interesting. Uh, in, in the 94 earthquake, we keep going back to 94, the uh, cathedral, St. Viviana, was uh, damaged. It was red tagged. Mm -hmm. And uh, the cardinal wanted to tear it down and, and rebuild. Mm -hmm. The conservation community did not. Uh, so the cardinal uh, looked for a new site, built a new cathedral. And there wasn't a big market for earthquake damaged cathedrals made of unreinforced brick on no foundation. Yeah. So Tom and Jerry bought it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it yeah, was yeah. four acres. It was the cathedral, the rectory, which was the Cardinal's home, uh, and a school. And we we started this venture to turn the cathedral into a venue. Yeah. And a bunch of us that worked for Tom worked worked moved into the rectory. Wow. Yeah. And later on I became uh, from I became acquainted with the Cardinal, with Monsignor Kostelnik, and mm -hmm. Monsignor Kostelnik, who was the pastor of the cathedral, had a dog named Joaquin, mm -hmm. and I had Buddy. And that plaza, it's a two and a half acre plaza mm -hmm. up there on Temple, and when the Archdiocese built it, the intention was for the plaza to be for the community, not mm -hmm. just Catholics. Mm -hmm. And so Monsignor Kostelnik and I said, well, what can we do to raise awareness? And I said, let's have an event with dogs. And so I named it uh, Dog Day Afternoon, uh, it, which was a movie, you can Google it. Dog Day <laughs> Afternoon at the Cathedral, a community event for downtown LA dogs and their humans. Yeah. And it was magical. And I did this one, uh, I was working for Carol. Uh, I, I started with Carol in 2001. And um, yeah, and we, th there was no agenda to the event other than community. Yeah. And now I think it was in its 12th year and there were 1,200 dogs and a, at least a thousand people uh, and it happens in July every year and go to downtownla.com uh, about oh, a month or two before You'll and you find can out. get information on 
dog day. Or, or just reach out to me because I'll be going. And yeah. let me just add to that what this experience really is. So you walk up a set of steps to get to this landing platform, which is the common area of, of, the, the, plaza the, of the plaza. Yeah. And so as your dog is walking up these steps and as it starts to see that uh, there are hundreds of other dogs in the space, your dog's like, is this for me? <laughs> you know, like it, like just, it gets so excited and like it, it, it is, it is such a fun event. Yeah. It is such a fun event. Everybody's smiling. The dogs are checking out each other. There's lots of little uh, dog swag that we get, and you know, you you run into people you haven't seen in a while. Mm -hmm. We tend to walk down with a group from our building, you know, so that's even in itself a community event for us. But it is a spectacular event. I mean, dogs yeah. of every size, and the, and your dog is like thanking you for days. Like, yeah. remember that thing we went to a couple of days ago? I love you. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, because like, he's got tennis balls and all these things to remember. But it, it's it's such a great day. And and I didn't mention, and the the Catholic nuns are blessing your dogs. Right. So you get a little certificate that your dog was blessed at the yeah. event, which is kind of cool. And sometimes and I've free. been blessed too. Yeah, it's free. I, sometimes she looks at me. Oh, I need to I'll take care of you too. Get. Yeah. I'm like I take them. Yeah, yeah. Of course. Yeah. But it's funny when she's like, Oh, I'll give you a blessing too. I'm like, Hmm. <laughs> what am I saying right now? <laughs> you know. Anyhow, but it's a fantastic event, and it it's things like this. You know, if 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 you're in a community, um, I don't know, is it an easy thing to take for granted that these things happen and, and we feel good about them, we get to see our neighbors, but all the work that goes into something yeah. like that, really, I mean, 12 years in the running, mm -hmm. and it started with an idea, and it probably started with a coffee with the... With, with the, with the Monsignor. Yeah, and just... It, at, yeah, at one point it was going to be an off-leash event yeah. until our lawyers and insurance agents got involved. Yeah. <laughs> so we didn't, we didn't do that, but... It was it was terrific, and you know, often people will tell me, "I can't believe what's going on in downtown LA," and I said, "I can. I've been working hard at it for 25 yeah. years." Yeah. You know, I, I say it's a it's a it's no very wonder I've been working on it for 25 years. It, people that haven't been here as long as I have been here, mm -hmm. that have joined even 10 years ago, have seen accelerated development and um, of of housing and of amenities and services. In downtown, so it's it's it looks uh, dramatic, and it is. But mm -hmm. the work that made that happen happened five years before. Mm. You know, like all the cranes in the sky, all those deals mm -hmm. started five years ago. Um, I, I I use the pronoun I a lot mm -hmm. because I have been a leader, mm -hmm. but it was the royal we mm -hmm. that that got got it done. But it was through leadership of Carol and myself and many other uh, people in the community, Tom Gilmore and others. Um, it's, it's not an accident that this renaissance is happening. No, not It's not all. an accident. I mean, we worked hard at it, and, um, and it, it, it grew organically, to use that word again, but there were, were also specific plans of ways to, to get to the promised land. Should we back up a little bit? So for people that don't know downtown Los Angeles, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there was a time when people were just not here, right? Mm -hmm. So they're, that they left, what, in the early 60s? 60s. Yeah, so un until... Uh, until the 1950s, mm -hmm. uh, downtown was the center of everything regionally. So all the business people really were here, the, the lawyers and the accountants. Uh, government was here, which is still here. We're, we're second only to Washington, D.C. as to the number of government workers. Uh, retail, you had to come downtown mm -hmm. to go to a department store. Uh, Bunker Hill uh, was where all the rich people uh, had Victorian lived. Homes. Yeah. But over, over the years, they started moving out, and the, the mansions became boarding houses, and then they, they, it, it got blighted. Mm -hmm. uh, so in the late 60s, those buildings were torn down, and we started over, and we started, the Union Bank building was the first one that mm -hmm. was built. And as I mentioned, people then lift, left this market to, to go to the new downtown. Mm -hmm. So nowadays, when people talk about downtown, they think about that skyline, yeah. and the area where we are, which is LA and 8th is historic downtown. Mm -hmm. you know, and then within downtown, there's probably 16 different neighborhoods and many sub-neighborhoods mm -hmm. uh, you know, below that. And, and unbelievable buildings you know, mm -hmm. from the 1920s, uh, you know, the Art Deco design, gargoyles, all, there's mm -hmm. unbelievable mm -hmm. architectural design down here. And yet I know local Los Angeles that have not experienced this, or the, the richness, the history, the tunnels, the the you know the speakeasies from right. the time it's all still here, 
and yet it kind of was left or pushed aside and then people like you and, and, and some of the people that you mentioned were like, hey, let's bring this back. Let's bring businesses here. Were some of them like, what do you see? Like, yeah. would, would you have to walk them around and like, you know, like were some people, did you have to pull a little bit harder to kind of- Yeah, more like understand? shackle. Yeah, you, know? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you called them every day. <laughs> yeah, there's a, there's a, I just want to finish the kind of the historical um, uh, story arc there. Mm -hmm. um, when we started to suburbanize after mm -hmm. World War II, we started to do, we did planning, mm -hmm. urban planning. We created things like Century City and Warner Center, and we started doing retail uh, all over the region. When that happened, uh, you didn't have to go downtown anymore. So we're talking about strip malls and mm -hmm. things. Well, in that and bigger, yeah. bigger shopping centers. Yeah. And you didn't have to come down to have an office. You could be somewhere else. So downtown went through a period of at least 20 years, maybe moving on 30, that uh, it was not the place to be, mm -hmm. you know, it, and uh, and people came down and it was kind of empty and they they didn't like that and then they stayed away for 30 years. So one of the things that I did when I was trying to recruit, what I ended up developing with with Carol, was I became the salesman of downtown, mm -hmm. um, and I helped to recruit office tenants, retail tenants, restaurants, bars, nightclubs to get people to invest money called equity or lend money called debt, developers mm -hmm. to build the buildings, uh, and then people to move into them. Mm -hmm. For 12 years I gave, uh, when, when I was with the bid, I gave uh, housing tours, I created the housing tours and uh, took people around for about four hours yeah. to show them what was, was happening. Yeah. And the way that I started those tours uh, is I said, every bad thing you've ever heard about downtown LA is true. 20 years ago, <laughs> you know, and, yeah. and when a salesman, you know, opens up and tells the truth, amazing things happen. Yeah. And uh, so, for instance, uh, Ralph's grocery store. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Ralph started his first grocery store here in downtown Los Angeles at the southwest corner of Spring uh, and Six. Okay. That's where he started. He was a stonemason. He had an accident. He lost his arm, and he became a grocer. Where. Um, the Wilshire Grand, our tallest building is now, was mm -hmm. the last Ralph's that got torn down before the other, um, uh, I think it was the Statler Hilton, was built. Mm -hmm. And in 1924, 100,000 people lived downtown. When I got here, 18,000 people wow. lived downtown. Um, and now it's up to about 70,000. Mm -hmm. But we knew that if we were to continue this uh, downtown residential rebirth, we had to have the same amenities and services that other neighborhoods had. Uh, so we went to Ralph's mm -hmm. and we told him our story and we said, you know, we want you to open a, a Ralph's in, in downtown LA. Mm -hmm. And they said, that's nice, you're going to get the experience of wanting because we're not coming. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> so we, uh, we got together and we said, well, how do we deal with this? And we did a demographic survey, just a grassroots um, demographic survey that we uh, publicized. And uh, we started getting data and input about who was living here mm -hmm. and who was in the office buildings. Mm -hmm. And it turned out downtown was a pretty affluent place. Mm -hmm. And downtown has diversity. It's the, the poorest of the poor and a, the worst homeless population in America mm -hmm. and the richest of the rich uh, are, are here. Mm -hmm. And uh, they all eat. They all need to eat food. And uh, Ralph's eventually uh, said yes to us. And they, they said, OK, we're going to bring you food for less. And we're like, well, we work 12 hours a day, and we really don't want to bag our own groceries. Mm -hmm. And then we did another study. And they bypassed Ralph's and went to Ralph's Fresh Fair. And uh, that opened 10 and a half years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, does a million dollars a week in sales. Uh, it's one of the highest grossing stores in, in uh, the region. Certainly. So they send you a big thank you basket well, at the holidays, Well, that's really, right? <laughs> yeah, they, everybody sent me a percentage point on that deal. <laughs> um, and, but two years in, my joke is if, if I had a ring, they'd kiss it, you know? <laughs> uh, and about two years into it, this is about community as well. Ralph's came to me and said, we're so excited to be with you in downtown LA and, you know, thank you. Uh, we'd like to give back and what can we do? And I said, well, thought about it for a minute. I said, we have a lot of empty tree wells. Buy some trees. So they bought us 25 um, trees that were uh, quite nice. quite mature. Yeah. And then I organized about 75 uh, volunteers in the LA Conservation Corps uh, taught us how to 
you know, plant trees. Mm -hmm. uh, I planted two jacaranda trees on the north side of 9th Street, uh, just east of the pantry. Mm -hmm. And then I also, uh, you know, I have pictures showing I dug the hole. Uh, <laughs> we believed you. I, but not in my Brooks Brothers. We believed brother, you. Not in my Brooks <laughs> Brothers suit. Oh, yeah. and, uh, I know all that working out. <laughs> that did pick, come off. Yeah, you know, well, I hadn't really done that uh, <laughs> then. But, and then I planted the jacaranda tree at the southwest corner of uh, 7th and Olive by the 7-Eleven. Mm -hmm. It was 10 feet tall when I planted it uh, eight years ago. Now it's 40 feet tall. Wow. And of all the things that I've had the privilege of helping happen, in downtown LA, those three trees are some of the most important to me because they'll can, you know, 57 years old, I got more days behind me than ahead of me. And uh, when I die, uh, which is annoying, um, you know, those trees will live on, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so will the built environment, mm -hmm. and so will the residents. And uh, I didn't have children, but I have a city. Yeah. You know? Yeah, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, that uh, that just kind of crosses off my next question here. <laughs> I'm starting to take away your material. <laughs> no, 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 no. Sorry. <laughs> this is why it's live. This is real. You yeah. know, I, I talk about Get this real. being fuel. Right. You know, like being able to sit with someone and learn something new and and see what inspires them and motivates them. So, mm -hmm. however it happens, it's still fuel and meaningful. Yeah. Um, yeah. So d my next question was, will it always be downtown LA for you? Mm. Yeah, uh, you know, I think you know, I'll drop dead doing an interview or giving a tour. You know, I think that's what will happen. At the end of the day, um, I'm a storyteller, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm a real estate guy, but I'm, I'm a storyteller. When I, when I started with Tom Gilmore, uh, that neighborhood, as I said, was extraordinarily mm -hmm. rough, and um, it, it, it daunted me a bit. And when I started taking people through, mm -hmm. um, you know, everything was empty. The ground floor didn't have anything. And I said, yeah, we're gonna have, we're gonna have a market here, and we're gonna have a restaurant here, and we're gonna have a dry cleaner here, we're gonna have a cobbler here, you know. And, uh, and it turned out people uh, wanted to move into this loft style product because it didn't exist anywhere else. Yeah, that's why I'm um, here. But I, I could not recruit any of those tenants that I just iterated. Mm -hmm. So we opened a restaurant ourselves. Tom opened a restaurant called Pete's uh, in the San Fernando building at the southeast corner of Fourth and Main. Okay. And that kind of started it. And then, and then I told people about what could happen, what could come. And eventually I got some victims that believed me. <laughs> and then they opened and they were successful. So I went from talking about what could be until somebody not only bit, but I took them into the boat, yeah. right? And then they were successful. And now it wasn't just this dream that I had, mm -hmm. but it did start as a dream. Yeah. I, I, I often say that, um, you know, I don't know psychically what's around the corner. I know because I'm planning to create it myself around the corner. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, that's what we've done in downtown LA. It was uh, a place that nobody wanted to go. Um, everything that I've done in my career, I, I've been told I couldn't do. And that just winds me up, <laughs> you know. I can relate to that, yeah. yeah. That winds me up, you know. And I'm just getting started. You yeah. know, I'm 25 years into it, and there's so much more that uh, we all can do yeah. uh, to build a, a greater downtown, and that includes a lot of things. Right now, we have um, publicly subsidized housing uh, in downtown, mm -hmm. and, uh, and there's a line from here to Miami for that. Then we have very expensive housing that's being developed in downtown, and it's not expensive because we have greedy, you know, developers. Mm -hmm. It takes four to seven years from the time you buy the dirt to the time you get your first dollar, mm -hmm. and it's very expensive to build. Yeah. And so it's expensive in downtown for condos, uh, you know, or apartments. Mm -hmm. And so there's, I don't know what the number is, 80 to 85 percent of people can't afford to live here, mm -hmm. and that's a problem. Uh, so we're, we're looking to start developing micro units, which are very small, where, where the only thing you'll do in this, this very small apartment is sleep, take a shower, go potty, you know, microwave something if you're lucky, have a date, <laughs> like I like to say. And you're going to live your life in the public realm mm -hmm. like you do in other cities, whether mm -hmm. it's Tokyo or Mexico City or New York. Mm -hmm. 
and, uh, and we can do it. And that'll, that'll rationalize pricing so that more people can afford these to live here. projects in the works already? Or this is the, the, the public next? policy is happening now okay. to make it easier to do. Okay. The, the secret behind the adapter reuse ordinance is because of the way it was written, if a developer bought a building, they knew they could convert it. Hmm. When you do gr what we call ground up development, it's a lot longer process. You have to do something called entitlements and go through the city and public benefits because the community wants something and it takes a long time. So mm -hmm. the idea uh, on micro units is to say, here's the rules, here's the box. Mm -hmm. You, you got to fit in this box and if you do, kumbaya. And uh, that will allow a lot more people to, to live in That's downtown. Great. So it, it's all about, downtown is about diversity, you know? So yeah, that's what makes it special. You know, it, it, there's challenge in diversity, there's opportunity mm -hmm. in diversity. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, keeps you on your toes, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. Uh, the, the pink elephant in the room for all of us is mental illness and homelessness. Yes. And it has always um, been here. Mm -hmm. uh, 100 years ago, uh, it was here. Uh, but we, as a matter of um, public policy, to use that term again, uh, when everybody moved out of downtown, uh, people vote where they live. So really starting in the 60s, when we started developing services and missions um, and uh, any kind of service for people that were alcoholics or mm -hmm. you know, drug addicts or, or mentally ill, and a lot of times they're all combined, I like to say that I qualify for all of that. <laughs> you know, I just you know, was able to get through it yeah. through the help of a lot, a lot of people. Mm -hmm. But we put all these things in one area where they were out of sight and out of mind, because if we tried to put the Midnight Mission in Brentwood mm -hmm. or Northridge or Woodland Hills, you get voted out of office, yeah. right? And we really created a cancer. And uh, now we have early release of prisoners with no infrastructure to, uh, to help them. Uh, mental illness uh, is daunting. We just don't have the facilities for it. Uh, we, we literally you know, have people dying in the streets. You know, while these ivory towers are being built, yeah. and uh, we got to fix it. It's a, it's a human rights crisis yeah. of unparalleled proportions, and we're starting to see good things happen. There's mm -hmm. been housing bonds, there have been a quarter cent sales tax by the county, uh, but we need to regionalize care in the 88 cities in the county of Los Angeles mm -hmm. and not have most of it concentrated here. Homelessness is occurring throughout, you know, the, the nation. Yeah. Um, and we just haven't uh, come up with a way to handle it. But you, you, could spend, you could build all the housing in the world, and if you go to someone and they refuse your help, the game's over. Yeah. Even though they're really not qualified to make that decision. And there's been a, a series of uh, federal lawsuits uh, that kind of ha have enabled this. And you know, I believe in people's civil rights. Mm -hmm. uh, the ACLU um, has been very involved with this. Uh, but an unintended consequence of these rights is to enable people to kill themselves. As surely as jumping off US Bank Tower or jumping in front of a bus, it's just happening slowly. Mm -hmm. And we need to do a better job of, of taking care of them. But nobody, nobody knows quite how to do it. Yeah. Because it's, it's been going on for 50, 60 years. Yeah. So, so I'm staying in the community um, to incrementally help in any way that I can to you know, get one person off the street, mm -hmm. uh, and but but this whole this whole renaissance that we have um, is not invincible, and so we need to to take care of people and uh, Every, you know, move well, forward. And people is everybody. People everybody. Is not, yeah, people yeah. is not just the new people that are moving down here. It's people that are on, that are on Skid Row or the ones that. <laughs> S say they don't want help. I mean, I experienced yeah. this quite a bit. Like we see the same people on the street, right. and um, they refuse help. You right. Know, uh, not everybody, but there are people many. that refuse help. Many, many. Uh, yeah. And you know, there's a number of dreams that I have going forward of things that I want. To are you accomplish. just reading my questions at a time? I'm sorry. <laughs> no. I'm doing a monologue rather. Than, I'm going to be quiet now. No. Love it. I, I love anticipate it. these questions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let, ask your question. Yeah, yeah, ask me a question. And uh, maybe <laughs> no. during the last 10 minutes, uh, you know, let me go crazy. No, I no. don't know. No, I want, I want to talk about that. What is it? So we know that there's challenges. I mean, there's massive amounts of growth going down here, and then there are challenges that, that we're facing with that. So what does the detail of your dreams look like? Mm. You know, what, what still needs to happen? Um, what projects do you want to see? Happen down here that haven't 
Yeah, that haven't happened yet. Yeah. Um, schools. To improve the public schools, mm -hmm. to uh, increase charter schools, and to build private schools. And if we could do that uh, and improve the quality of the, of the public schools, we have a 55% dropout rate in the public schools in downtown. By the way, they're the most expensive schools ever built in America. You know, billions of dollars have been spent uh, in LAUSD and mm -hmm. uh, many hundreds of millions on our local schools. But 90% of the kids in those schools are Spanish speaking as their first language. And then they're on the same college curriculum in high school as somebody in an affluent community. Mm. But they don't, their parents probably didn't go to school mm -hmm. or work in two jobs and there's no support. And then there's a cultural imperative to get to work and bring money into our 10 person, one bathroom apartment. Mm -hmm. And they drop out. Mm -hmm. Well, here's how we fix it. Um, I believe that downtown should be the location of choice for empty nesters uh, and senior citizens. We need uh, five levels of housing. Independent living, assisted living, skilled nursing, memory care, and hospice. Mm -hmm. Just They call it aging in place. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the most important people that I ever met on one of my tours was a social worker. And here's what she did. Just imagine there's an 85-year-old widow in a 4,000 square foot house in Hancock Park and she's fine and the next moment she had a, a catastrophic stroke mm -hmm. and she's paralyzed mm -hmm. and she's, she's never going back into that house. She's going into a room. Well, if the stroke doesn't kill her, the depression will. Mm -hmm. So the social worker's job was to help detach. Well, what if we could do that before there's a catastrophic event? People that are living in these big homes that they don't need anymore. We could do a photo you know, memory book of the homes. People could give away their, their artifacts if anybody will take their Wedgwood mm -hmm. uh, or, or sell it in a non, you know, a non fire sale mm -hmm. and sell the real estate and move downtown. And guess what? They can volunteer to help the kids with their homework. It'll give them a raison d'etre to get out of bed in the morning or to volunteer at the midnight mission. Mm -hmm. But downtown is a location for seniors because it's flat, walkable, there's public transportation, there's sports, there's culture, there's, there's uh, uh, me uh, medical care. Just every and there's and there's um, you know you're close to the airport delivery systems and yeah everything and that community you need. Yeah, yeah. and community right yeah so we, we should do that but guess what if we have people in the streets that are in really bad shape it retards that yeah because it's it is it is scary mm -hmm. you know and most people on the streets that you see that look scary are not uh, but every once in a while there is somebody. And you just, you know, it's a city. It's, mm -hmm. it's not Hidden Hills, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. So. I like this. I, I love the idea of um, living in a community that has diversity, diversity in age, diversity in background, and then finding a way to bring people together on that. You know, so right. to have somebody that's helping someone after school or, mm -hmm. you know, teaching them. Um, exposing them to a new culture. I think mm -hmm. that that is my definition mm -hmm. of a great community. Like, right. you know, to, and, and to have surprising experiences. You don't have a surprising experience unless some sort of diversity was involved. Like when somebody does something that you didn't expect them to do and it was kind yeah. or, yeah. you know, made your day, like it, that happens through diversity because you, right. you know, you're not expecting it. You know, yeah. you're not expecting to connect with a seven year old child or a 70 year old woman. You know, it, it's nice when it happens. Mm -hmm. I like that. I like the schools, um, mm -hmm. br um, letting people know that this is a place for empty nesters. Mm -hmm. I've had that conversation at dinner parties, actually, mm -hmm. where people have uh, had their children move out and they're asking me about downtown for that reason, that they, right. they're downsizing and they want to you know, check it out. Mm -hmm. And I say, two thumbs up. <laughs> yeah, and, and people are starting to do it, and it's certainly, uh, you know, it's not for everyone. But I wanted to make a, a link here between, mm -hmm. you know, education. Um, I think if we did the kind of tutoring I'm talking about, we could take the dropout rate from 55% to 5% in you know, 10 to 20 years. It'll take a while. Mm -hmm. uh, charter schools, but private schools are important because um, I've been talking for, for quite a while to uh, Paul Cummins, who started the Crossroads and mm -hmm. the New Roads School. And if we had a great private school where like 40% of the kids were on scholarship, mm -hmm. then uh, People that are not even living downtown, but are commuting, can bring their kid downtown to school, mm -hmm. have parenting time they currently don't have when they're commuting two to three hours a day. Mm -hmm. There'll probably be no verbal communication because the kid's going to be on the device, <laughs> but at least they'll have time. Yeah. And 
But the reason all of this is important is when people are having babies in downtown, and then when their uh, kid gets to be about three and a half, they're moving to the suburbs. Yes. And for all, you know, a lot of reasons, mm -hmm. uh, including education and uh, the mental illness pro problem. Uh, and they, they do, and, they, and they, most of us grew up in a suburban mm -hmm. model. And they do it, but now their jobs are still downtown. So, so now the, the kid gets the ranch style house, the white picket fence, the golden retriever, and the au pair. Yeah, but less of their parents. <laughs> but they lose their parents because yeah. they're still like Gibson, Dunn, and Crusher. And, you know, I just, there's just something wrong with that. Yeah. And we're not building housing stock that's con conducive to families either. And it's kind of a chicken or the egg thing. Yeah. So, and parks and yeah. other things. Right. We need other amenities to mm -hmm. keep the kids here. Right. Yeah. So see, although I, I see kids really enjoying Grand Park. Like, yeah. Well, you know. we're starting to we're starting to get some of that. I, I, Elysian Park uh, is hundreds of acres, much of which is unused. Mm -hmm. And because our land now is so expensive in downtown, getting more parks in the center of downtown is going to be hard. So I think we really have to start thinking about how do we get the population to the resource. I think you need to have some else again. Hey, yeah. remember when you gave us some trees? <laughs> how about a park? Yeah. <laughs> or, or what if we got McDonald's? <laughs> What if we got McDonald's and Coca-Cola to sponsor dash buses that just circulated up to the park all the time with a couple crates in there That'd so you can nice. take your dog? So, see, yeah. I, that's why I'm going to die because there's lots to do. Yeah, you know? I hear you. Uh, somebody told me I'm going to live to be 93 years old. And, why that uh, number? I, I, well, I, I actually talked to this psychic. Uh -huh. This is, you know, true confessions. <laughs> and, uh, and I didn't know her, but she had been recommended to me because yeah. I was at the point in my life with drugs and alcohol. That was just crazy. And she was hitting all this stuff that was happening without knowing me. Yeah. So I said, you know, how long will I live? And she hesitated. I said, just tell me. She said, 93. I said, okay. I'm going to work with that. So I'm going to presume that I'm going to live to be 93. If I don't, it's okay. Okay. Frankly, if I died today, what an interesting life I've had. But the most important part of my life is being of service. Mm -hmm. You know, people um, will call me Mr. Downtown or the Mayor Downtown. Somebody recently promoted me to <laughs> King. <laughs> but um, when I was a, when I was well, a, the Mayor was okay with yeah, that. Though, I know. Wasn't he? he was okay with yeah, that. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, and uh, somebody called me the unofficial Mayor of Downtown. I'm like, you demoted me. Um, but when I was a little kid, this is about service. When I was a little kid, I wanted to be a butler because I'm a very nurturing guy. Uh, I'm a cancer. We're kind of known for that, and an only child. Mm -hmm. And I like you know, talking to people. And I decided that I wanted to, to uh, be a butler. Mm -hmm. And the reason, and Family Affair was on. Google Mr. French. And, uh, and there was a lot of shows, you know, Arthur had a butler, and then there was Mr. Belvedere was and Benson, Benson yeah. right? A lot of people still aren't getting that. Google yeah, it. I know. Um, we talked about Benson this week. I don't even remember why. But we there actually you go. I know, I know why. Because right. that's a show that they could not bring back now. Yeah. It's like you're seeing all these new shows. Yeah. And if you look at that, it would not fly today. Yeah. And Jeffrey on the Prince of Bel-Air. Yeah. So I wanted, I wanted to live in a mansion and be a butler because if, uh, if I uh, lived in a mansion, I, uh, you know, as its butler, I wouldn't have to pay for it. <laughs> so I thought that was a good business model, you know. <laughs> so I actually think of myself as the butler of downtown. Like you know, the whole, all of downtown is my, my mansion. Yeah. And, you know, I'm here to, to serve the people within it and help in any, you know, any way that I can. When I'm walking down the street and I see a piece of trash on the sidewalk, uh, I pick it up. And uh, not every time, but most of the time, yeah. I pick it up. I would no sooner leave that piece of paper on the sidewalk than a piece of paper on my floor in my loft. I agree you with know. you. I, my biggest pet peeve is people not understanding they're in community with other people. Right. Like they live and breathe and thrive. And, you know, I experience less of it here, but right. still occasionally experience it. Yeah. Like, you know, I'm a dog owner, you're a dog owner. I, it's just the worst thing to see somebody not clean up after their dog because yeah. you, you know, you know that you do that and you're supposed to do that. And, yeah. and, and it's like, how do you not know? We're all, this is our shared space, right? You know, this is our shared space. So I take pride in this space too. You know, yeah. it's, it's my community. Yeah. Um, you know, making sure, th be noticing that someone's six steps behind you, and you're about to enter in an elevator, and you hold the elevator for them. Right. <laughs> you know? Although I got to tell you something <laughs> about courtesy. Yeah. Oh, I want to tell you one thing about picking up that trash. Okay. I do. You know, wash my hands when I get to wherever I'm going. Well, we assume that. <laughs> Because yeah. he shakes a lot of hands. People I are like, I, know. I shook Hal's yeah. hand yesterday. And if it's icky trash, I call the bid and they do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, so that's, you know, that's, that's what happens. 
yeah. with that. So courtesy, you're going to say something? Yeah, like courtesy. Uh, uh, and this happens to, I don't want um, to alienate any millennials <coughs> that might be watching this. But there's just kind of a different sense of courtesy between generations. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure the generation before me said the same thing about us baby boomers. Um, but f like I'll hold the door for somebody and they'll just walk through right by me <laughs> and they won't nod at me or say, you know, thanks. Yeah. Nothing. Yeah. And, so then, and similarly, they'll like cut me off and they won't turn to say, excuse me. They just keep walking. Yeah. And uh, I find that, you know, but you know, ex expectations are the seeds of I've, resentment. <laughs> I, I try, yeah. I try to, you know, not make it a generational mm -hmm. thing, and I blame the phone more. I blame the technology yeah. hacking your brain, and like everybody's wired. This is more important. Yeah, when they're, when they're crossing time. the street. Yeah, and it's I've literally saved people's <laughs> lives because they've stepped out and like, hey, look up, look up, right. you know. Or I've but done they're, the same thing. But they're they're irritated because they're bumping to you, and I don't find it. It's a generational thing even though there's a lean towards millennials, but I think it's more your brain's being hacked and you're not aware of it. Like right. you're really, when this thing becomes more important than this thing, there is a problem. Right. Because I'm telling you, I said it at the top of the hour, that you know, how you relate with others makes or breaks your day. Right. And that's you, that's your world, you're in control of that. And if you stop to understand that you're in community with other people and mm -hmm. smile, mm -hmm. you would feel better. Yeah. about how your position in the world. It's very simple math. Right. You do better, you feel better. Exactly. Um, you know, you wouldn't step in front of a bus and you shouldn't be looking at your phone when you're crossing a street. No. Just, just, no. It's just silly. It's very silly. And it used to upset me all the time, except it became so prevalent. My attitude is, you know, it, it's Darwinian. It's like, I don't want that gene pool of stupidity being, you know, put forward. Yeah. That's how I've rationalized. Yeah. I don't really feel that I way. Just, but, I just, I know. want, I'm the, there's a part of me that wants to say something like, can I, can I share something with you? You know, your brain's being hacked. I, you I, know? I, like, I, I want to say <laughs> something. Like, just <laughs> to, <laughs> to the knowledge. You know, and when they're hooked up, yeah. I've, I've literally tapped them and I'm waiting to get cold cocked. And they'll pick it out and I said, you know, the guy in the car is doing the same thing and he's going to win. And they're like, <gasps> so I want to. That's wanted, a good one. I want to tell your viewers a, a true story okay. that does not end well, which is related to this. Okay. A friend of mine was oh. in Santa Monica. No, it's, <laughs> it's, you know, it'll save your life. Um, so a friend of mine was in Santa Monica and he was sitting eating in a restaurant and this woman was walking along at full tilt and she walked into a pole and she fell, she hit her head. Uh, hit her brainstem and she died right there on the spot and that wasn't even in an intersection now mind you i am guilty of everything i'm talking about yeah. at one point or another so what do they say one finger at them three at me yeah but i'm becoming aware of it not doing it yeah you know the, more the best what best recommendation i have on this is just turn your alerts off on your phone right you know when you start to find yourself experiencing the world again and not just the phone, you won't go back to that. Right. You won't go back to that. Well, because all of this, um, it's, isn't it funny that through, we call it social media, through Facebook, etc., we do build some community through this machine. Mm -hmm. uh, my mom was able to find all kinds of childhood friends with mm -hmm. it and then call them up and talk. Um, one of the things that I find, though, is you know, I spend quite a bit of time looking at, you know, a Facebook feed or looking at Instagram or something else. And I'm aware of what my friends are doing. And I have the incorrect, um, <laughs> the in incorrect, incorrect impression that I'm having a relationship with them. Yeah. What I'm really being is a voyeur. <laughs> and yeah. then I really don't need to get together with them because I know what they've been yeah. doing. There's nothing to talk about. I got no material. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and that's what's happening too. Yeah. So people are, because the experience of getting together is a lot like that. I don't know yeah. what to say. Yeah. I don't, you know, I, I don't really know what to do once we're together because I feel like I know everything. But you don't. You only know somebody's highlight reel of what they're posting. They either put, we either post, human, human behavior is either we post this like spectacular thing that we just did or the woe is me moment that you're looking for sympathy. There's a lot of life that happens in between those two mm -hmm. and you can't assume that you know what's going on with somebody. No, you can't. Yeah. I, I've had some friends that uh, have gotten cancer 
and have shared the whole experience, losing their hair and everything else, and sometimes dying mm -hmm. on Facebook. And what I love about that is they're teaching me how to live life on life's terms. Mm -hmm. That you know, we all owe them uh, a debt, and you know, sometimes thankfully they recover. But whether it's illness or anything else, when people share things that other people can use, yeah, um, I think it's good. You know, I think the devices, smartphones, are perhaps one of the best and worst things ever invented. I agree. And so, but it's not going away. Yeah. It's not going away. So the question is, how can we manage the technology uh, rather than the technology managing us? Yeah. And for our friends and business associates to presume that we're going to be, since they can communicate with us immediately, that we can respond immediately. Mm -hmm. And I like this idea of turning off the alerts and focusing on you know what's before you so you can kind of get in a groove. Yeah, and, and you of course when you do that you communicate to people you know you right. tell your colleagues and your friends that they're off so don't don't expect to get a text back from me yeah. right away that's not what I'm doing I'm trying to be more in the now and be present with the person that's in front of me and if I have those alerts on it, that's not going to happen you're going to be reacting to it all the time so yeah you just but you have to communicate that when you make that that's decision. Right. So we are closely running out of time oh here. Oh no! Yeah, so it's gone fast. It has gone fast. We could talk about so many things. I could have you on, and we, there's so many things we could talk about. But I'm gonna skip right to the last thing that we do on the show, which is called Heart's Wealth. And what it is is an opportunity for you to acknowledge, um, uh, give a tribute, um, just acknowledge a person that has made a meaningful impact in mm -hmm. your life that deserves a shout out. And mm -hmm. the reason, and it could be one or two or a group, yeah. you know, it could be several. But the reason that I ask everybody to do this is to show that, you know, this is an important part of relating mm -hmm. to, like to acknowledge people and compliment them and let them know that they've showed up in a way that's been meaningful to you. And I hope by doing this that other people pick up the phone and call somebody and do this in person. And, you know, we all raise the level of compassion together by doing it. We just taking the time to slow down and go, you you mean something to me and you need to hear it. Right. So do, does someone come to mind? Well, a couple. So, okay. Uh, you, uh, you you know, <laughs> the, so one would be Tom Yoma. Okay. And uh, uh, Ed Rosenthal, who introduced me to him. Uh, Ed had sold all the buildings to Tom. Mm -hmm. And I had called Tom like nine times mm -hmm. and he wouldn't return my call. And I said, Ed, can you get him to return my call? And he did. Mm -hmm. Without, and then, then you know, Tom took the call, he took the meeting, and if that, if Ed hadn't done that, I wouldn't be sitting here with you. So Tom and, and leasing and creating community there because of Ed uh, was important. And then when Carol Schatz uh, called me, I, I said, Tom, what do I do? He says, you gotta take it. Mm -hmm. So everybody has been my mentor in my life, um, but I spent 13 years with Carol and uh, you know, she she suffers nothing less than excellence. So, you know, you learn you know, you learn how to get things done and stay a step ahead, which is very difficult with Carol, and to perform or, or create new events. We also created a, a Halloween party for downtown kids. You know, so it's really nice when you leave an organization, and you know the dog day is still going on, the tours are still going on, the Halloween party still going on because it's not about me. Yeah, you know, it's it's about uh, the community. So I think Tom and Carol. Um, you know, have been critical, and you know, three and a half years ago, I just I went out on my own to do all kinds of things, um, and but without without that training, I, I couldn't have done it. So, hats off to Carol and Tom. That's awesome. What comes up for me when you share that is just the reminder for people to see that you're not you're never alone. This myth of ended there's a Independence is a myth. You know, if someone might see you on the street mm -hmm. and you're by yourself and they're like, oh, that's how, that's Mr. Downtown. But what you just shared is like, there were certain situations mm -hmm. with certain people that seeded your right. legacy, your right. growth, your opportunity to contribute to this community in a meaningful way. And without those people in those moments, right. this wouldn't happen. That's right. And during the course of it, I've met 14,000 people. Yeah. You know, I, I say I have 14,000 friends. And they, and you know, when I walk the streets of downtown, I'll often get stopped and uh, to say hello. And they're very familiar with, you know, who I am. Yeah. Um, sometimes I'm like, hmm, hi, how are you? It's good to see you. Because <laughs> it is. You always say good to see you. It's good to see you. <laughs> you, know, you know, the worst thing is they, like, do you remember me? Do you remember my name? Do you know, they ask you a direct yeah. question and you just say, no. 
<laughs> no. Yeah, I'm sorry. I said, you know what? You're memorable, but my memory is not. That's a nice line. That's yeah, a really nice line. That's another line. one you can use with no license. Yes, yeah. I like it. I will use it. Yeah. Well, this has been delightful. I hope Abs so. Absolutely delightful. Uh, you know, so much inspiration about community and doing your thing and being excited about what you're doing and acknowledging people and continuing to do what you do and by, by um, so much, so much richness, richness in this conversation. I really appreciate uh, it. And thank you for, you know, saying hello and think I'm relevant to your show and, and uh, asking me some questions. And I'm sorry that I asked some of your questions without That's all without right. I, I, you know, this is why. <laughs> I get paid to talk, so, <laughs> yeah, this you is know, among other things. So I'm sorry I interrupted no, you. No, no, I'm, I'm all good. This is real conversations. So yeah. I, didn't, I never wanted to do an edited show. Yeah. This is what it's like. This is real. And all of the ums, buts, whatever, you know, I like it. It's fine. Okay. It's real. So thank you for being here today. You can learn more about Hal Bastian and his work at halbastian.com and at Hal Bastian DTLA on Instagram and Facebook. And yeah. I'm sure you can find him on LinkedIn as well. Yeah. Yeah. And if you look up Hal Bastian on uh, YouTube, you can see 46 episodes of uh, uh, little videos that I do with Ryan Morris, who used to produce for Hill Hauser. Nice. And you'll learn more about downtown. So people watching that are not in Los Angeles, you'll actually see why, why I'm so excited about this, why I changed everything about my life to move here three years ago, and why he's devoted his life to downtown. So watch those videos and you'll, you'll learn about the community that we love. Yeah, join us in our journey. Join us in our journey. And that does bring us to the end of the show. Uh, next week, you're gonna love this. So author of Assholes, A Theory with Aaron James. He's a professor that wrote a book on dealing with assholes. Wow. I know. I'm, I'm, I can't wait to ask My strategy is I just don't deal with them. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I can't. I, there's so many questions yeah, I have, have for watch. him. Yeah, I'm really excited about that. Um, so he will be our guest next week. You know, the social challenge of the week, I think, is just um, look, at, look in your local community and see how you can get involved. And if that's not your thing, if you feel like you um, have you know, so little time, just acknowledge the people that are in your community. Take the time to go, you know what? I really like how you make my coffee. Thank you. Thank you for always having a smile for doing this. You know, thank you for being here in this place every time that I need something. You know, mm -hmm. Acknowledge people in a way that it takes you a moment to actually look in their eyes and say thank you and say something meaningful. So, and ask them their name. And Yeah, and if you don't know their name, <laughs> if you don't know thought. their name, of course, yeah. <laughs> if you don't know their name, ask their name. That would be great. So let me know if you take the social challenge. You can reach out to me on Twitter at Love More Now or Instagram Relate with Steph. Uh, the archives of the show will be on stephaniemichelle.com by Thursday of this week. And as always, I just want to encourage people to relate with more curiosity. You know, think about what that means, but just put a little more curiosity in the way that you're relating. And we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye.